Hello everyone, I'm Khashayar Baruti from EPFL and today I'll be presenting a joint work with Suvadi Panik, Serge Wadane and Hai Luyan called Neo Attacks on Low MC Instances with a Single Plain Text Ciphertext Pair. So as you see, the name is long, so I've shortened it here. So let's talk about Picnic Low MC first and see why do we even care about it. So Picnic is a post-quantum signature scheme, which is based on a... MPC in the heads paradigm, specifically talking the specialized version of ZK Wu. So this is a proof of identification. Then we have some Fiat Shamir or similar transform in order to change it to a turn it into a signature scheme. And it's currently an alternate candidate for third round of NIST BQ standardization process. So how does ZK Wu work? So simply we have a public key, which is going to be a pair of plain text and cipher text. So this is important that our key actually consists of a given plain text and ciphertext. And then we have a key, SK, a secret key, which is going to work as the encryption key. And what the prover is trying to do is that he's trying to prove that he knows an SK value such that E of PK and SK is going to be C. And how does, how do, how does the prover do this? The prover will simulate an MPC computation of E and then we'll commit to the computations on each share. And then the verifier is going to ask him to open some of the commitments in a specific way, and then check that for that share, the computation was done correctly. So what's the catch here is that because the prover has to do an MPC computation, multiplications are not ideal. So we want as few as them as possible without losing much security. And that's why, mm, like, MPC in general is one of the reasons that people have been working on a lot on block ciphers which have low multiplication depths. Okay. Low MC is one of these ciphers, so it's a substitution permutation network. It has a 3-bit S-box. It's a quadratic S-box, as you can see, pretty simple. And uh, it's followed by an affine layer and a key addition. Round keys are also affine functions of the master key, so the only nonlinearity in the cipher comes from the S-box. So, there are two main variants that we will be talking about. It's called the partial S-box layer and the full S-box layer variants. I'll explain those in a sec. So, by S, I will denote the number of S-boxes per round. N is going to be the block size, R is going to be number of the rounds. So, this is how a single round looks like. So, each S-box is acting on three disjoint bits of the block, of the input and then it's followed by an affine layer on the whole state, and then I add the round key. And whenever my s is exactly equal to n over 3, meaning that every bit of the block passes through the s-box, I call it a full layer, and whenever uh, 3s is less than n, I call it a partial layer. So let's talk about work that has already been done. So two famous attacks that have that exist on low MC are Reckberger's attack from TOSC 2018, which uses some difference in enumeration attack, and then Liu's improvement of it in Crypto 21, which uses some algebraic tricks to improve the previous attack. But as you can see from the name, we need differences for these attacks, meaning that with a single plain text cipher text pair, which is the scenario that we have in Picnic, we cannot perform these attacks. So we care about complexity one attacks in the uh, in the given plain text ciphertext model. And this is where these other attacks come into play. So the first one that came out was our previous work that surprisingly is not presented yet. So we use uh, some uh, algebraic property of the S-box to be able to linearize the S-box with not many guesses and then, for the full S-box layer variant, we break up to two rounds. And the partial S-box layer variant, we break up to 0.8 and over S rounds, versions of low MC. And these are not arbitrary, these numbers. They actually come from the low MC crypt analysis challenge. And also, there is the NURS attack from Eurocrypt 21, which is based on multi-parity counting. And this attack only works for the full S-box variance, because we need low number of runs, we need the degree of the polynomials to be low, and then it breaks up to five runs, and uh, for n equal to 129, which is the smallest block size that we have, it breaks up to four runs. Okay. So, 
what's going to happen here. So we will present a two-step MITM attack, which uses the linearization ideas from our previous work, plus some gray code enumeration methods, which breaks the full layer variant up to three rounds and the partial variant up to n over s rounds. Okay. So let's talk about the linearization that we already talked about. So this is the theorem from our previous paper. And what it essentially means is that if I guess any balanced quadratic Boolean function in the inputs of, of the inputs of the S-box, based on that guess, I can linearize the S-box. So I can write the S-box for any balanced Boolean function in the input as that function times a linear function plus another linear function. So it's the example that we used almost everywhere during the previous work was the 3-bit majority function as this balanced function. And how does the attack work? Simply for every single S. As I said, the only nonlinearity comes from the S box. So if I linearize all the S boxes, everything will be linear. And then I, I get an equation system in my key uh, based on the majority guess that I do. So what I will do exactly, I will guess all the majorities for every single S box in the cipher. Then I will uh, form a linear equation in the key describing the ciphertext in the plain text on the key. And then I will do a Gaussian elimination to solve this. And then I need to do one re-encryption to, to see if this key is a good candidate, whether all the majorities match. So as you can see, I need two to the power number of S boxes guesses, majority guesses, and for each majority guess, one encryption. So this only works when S times R is less than N. And now let's talk about the new attack. So this attack is also influenced by the previous work, but it's a bit different because it uses the other attack proposed in our former work, which was a meet in the middle attack, but of worse complexity than the linearization. So the idea is I will not touch the first round, but for everything that comes after, I will guess the majorities and linearize them. <clears throat> so what I get is that if I look at the output of the first round, or the input of the rest of the rounds, they're, they're the same thing. Then I can write the value here as a linear function of the key and the ciphertext. So simply, I will split my key into two parts, the first half of the key and the second half of the key, k1 and k2. So I can get equations of this form describing the state at the middle. So simply it's gonna be a k1 plus bk2 plus some constant is going to be describing the state in the middle. Again, dependent on the majority guess. Now I'll do the same thing in the forward direction, but this time I will not do any linearization. I will just describe the state here as a quadratic function of the plain text and the keys. And again, I can write it in this form as fk1 plus gk2 plus uh, some constant is going to be equal to that state. So, and what I have is that these two terms should be equal to each other, and I will use this to mount a meet in the middle attack. Okay, so let's see how it goes. So I take, uh, in the case that I have now, I will take k1 to be n over 3, k2 to be 2n over 3. I will guess the majority of the S boxes on the late, later rounds, as I said. I'm going to linearize them, and then I'm going to make these quadratic equations bringing everything in K1 to the left and bringing everything in K2 to the right side. Now, these functions only depend on K1 and these functions only depend on K2. So what we did in the previous work was that we guess the value of K1, we make this list one, which simply holds uh, the left-hand side evaluated for the K1 guesses and then another list which holds the right-hand side of the equation for the K2 guesses. And then we check for, we look for a collision between these two lists. Here, we will do something slightly different. So we have that AIs are linear and F and G are both quadratic. But F and G are not quadra are quadratic functions, but they don't, if I, if I look at their spectrum, they don't have every possible monomial in the key bits and every possible quadratic monomial. In fact, the only monomials that they have are the simple ones plus 
the ones that appear in the output of the S-box. So what do I do? I split my K2 again into two parts, into K21 and K22. Then I express this F and G that I had as linear functions in a space of twice the size with the spaces. And uh, I will call them, let's say, F bar and G bar. So now I have a linear uh, equality of this form. Simply, both left hand side and right hand side are linear. And what I can do, because I, this is for every i, I can write this as a matrix equation of this form. Okay. <clears throat> now this f function, this large capital F, is for sure uh, it's not a the full rank matrix, so it has a null space. Let's call that h. h is the kernel of f, as I said. And then I split g based on this splitting of k2 that I did already. So, and I derive to an equation of this form, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by h. So, and what I will have is that h was the kernel of f. So, I get an equation of this form because the left hand side is going to be zero. So again, now I have a left hand side which is only in k21, a right hand side which is only in k22. So this is perfect to mount a meet in the middle attack again. So <clears throat> it goes exactly as you think. So I'm just going to uh, exhaust all the values of k21 and compute the values, evaluate the values on the left hand side of my equation. And then I'm going to exhaust all the k22 values and evaluate everything on the right hand side of the equation and look for a collision. And then I will keep a list of all these good collisions. So let's see how many collisions we will be finding. So we have 2 to the power n over 3 possible values for k21. We have 2 to the power n over 3 possible values for k22. So what is the size of k2? Let's see. So we said that k21 and k22 are of equal size. And I say that k2 is 2n over 3 bits. So. The only, when, whenever for every x1 and x2 I have that hx1 is equal to hx2, it means that x1 minus x2 is going to be in kernel of h. So the probability of for every random x1 and x2, uh, h times x1 being equal to h times x2 is going to be 2 to the power dimension of kernel of h1 over 2 to the power 2n. So these are the differences and these are the possibilities. So, <clears throat> and I have that the dimension of the kernel is 2n minus n over 3. This is because of the property that it's the null space matrix of function f. And exactly, because f hat is con uh, constraining n over 3 variables. So the probability of a collision for a pair, for a given pair, is 2 to the power uh, minus n over 3. So what is the expected number of collisions? It's going to be total number of pairs times this probability, which is going to be 2 to the power n over 3. OK. So let's see, after we get this set kb, what are we going to do? Everything is going to be exactly similar to what we did before, what I explained in the beginning. So for every value of k2 that I have, I will evaluate this equation. For every value of k1 that I have, I will evaluate this equation, and I will look for a collision again. But here, the point is that there are 2 to the power n over 3 possible values for k1, and 2 to the power n over 3, around 2 to the power n over 3 values for k2, because this set is not all the possible values, but we've already done one check on it. And then I would return the whole key that I've recovered from here. So let's go through the complexity analysis for a second. So we have this many majority guesses. Then you have to compute one equation, the equation that I described in the beginning. So that's going to be one partial encryption. There's going to be one Gaussian elimination because we have to find that kernel matrix. And then there are two MITMs. So for the first one, 
I have to evaluate quadratic polynomials on this many input, 2 times 2 to the power n over 3 inputs. For this, I'm going to use some gray code enumeration method. And the second MITM is going to be evaluating quadratic polynomials again over 2 to the power n over 3 quadratic polynomial uh, size input set. Okay. So now let's talk about the partial layer version. <coughs> Okay, so I will divide my rounds that I have here into four different distinct types. So there's going to be the A rounds, which are in the beginning. The keys that appear in, uh, the round keys that appear here, I'm going to express them as Ka. There are going to be B, B rounds, which are the B rounds after the A rounds. So Kb describes the keys there. I'm going to have the C rounds with corresponding keys Kc, which are the last C rounds. And then I will have the middle rounds, which I will be linearizing, and then the keys, the key, the entropy of the key that is left from these three one, uh, three round keys, I will call it k rem. So it's going to be n minus three s a plus b plus c qubits. So let's see why this is true first. So the idea is for rounds a, b, and c, I will push. Uh, the round keys uh, forward somehow, so forward and backward, such that the round keys would be small, would actually be of for every single round that I have in these three rounds, the round key is going to be three S bits only. And how is this done? As you can see, the portion that is not passing through the S box, I can just pass it through the affine layer and push it to the next layer. And if I keep doing this, I will have one big round key in the end, and all the round keys before that are going to be pretty small. Okay, so for a for first a plus b rounds, I'm going to push everything forward, and for the last uh, r minus r one rounds, I'm going to push everything backwards. So the big key that I have here is going to appear in that middle rounds that I described, and for all A, B, and C rounds, I will have small round keys. Okay, so as I said, KA, KB, and KC will be 3SA, 3SB, 3SC bits long, respectively. And the entropy left is this much. Okay, so now let's see what I will do. So for every S box, I will add two sets of variables, the inputs and the outputs of the S box. So U is the input, Z is the output. Now if you check here, these DIs are only are a linear function in my X values and my Z values. So this is good. So D is a linear function of X values and Z values. And then if I look here, these E values are a linear function of D's and Z's. And these themselves were a linear function of x and z. So I will get that w, which is the output of my b rounds, is going to be a linear function of my z's and my x's, which x's were the outputs of the a rounds and the inputs to the b rounds. Okay, And then I call the output of the middle rounds to be y, or you can think of it as the output of the inverse of the last C rounds. Okay. So what I will do, I will guess the majority for the, for the middle rounds and linearize everything. So now I have that y is a linear function of w and the qubits. So as I say, w can be written as a linear function of z and x's, and y can be written as a linear function of w and the keys. So y can be written as a linear function of z, the key, bits, and x's, because I just replaced w with, the represent, with its representation in terms of z and x. Now I have a linear system which has way more variables than equations, so I can eliminate some of these variables. So what I will eliminate will be the kb variables, the krem variables, and z. And this will give me a linear equation of this form. So an affine function of Ka and x is going to be equal to an affine function of Kc and y. And this is actually good, 
Because if you remember, x was the output of the first a rounds, and y was the output of the inverse final c rounds. So x only depends on ka and pt, and y only depends on kc and ct. So I can mount a meet in the middle attack. So how does the first meet in the middle work? I will guess the value of ka and compute x out of it. Then I will make a hash table and index it by the left-hand side of my equation that I had before with this computed values of ka and x. Then I will guess kc and compute y out of it and do the same thing and look for a collision. And I will keep a good list, a list of good ka's and kc's. So now let's see this, how the second MITM works. So here I'm trying to get rid of the KBs in a sense. So if you look at the first round, KB is simply the XOR of UIs and XIs from here. Because exactly the input of the SBOX is XIs plus the round keys. Then here if you look, these KBs that appear here are XOR of DIs and DUIs again. And DIs were a linear function in X and Z. So KB can be seen as a linear function of U, X, and Z. So, and Y, if you remember, was a linear function of x, z, k, b, k, a, k, c, and k, rem. So I will just replace k, b by u, x, and k, z. And now I will eliminate k, rem from here. Okay? So this will give me some affine equation of this one. An affine function of z and u is going to be equal to an affine function of k, a, k, c, x, and y. Which, again, this equation is going to allow me to perform a meet in the middle attack. So, again, it goes as we guessed. So, I've already created a good a list of good KAs and KCs. So, for every KA and KC that are in that good list, I will compute this value. I will evaluate that affine function that I had on KA, KC, X, and Y. And if you remember, X and Y were only dependent on KA and KC. Then I will exhaust all the u values, which are in 0, 1 to the power 3sb, and compute the affine function, which was on the left-hand side of my equation, based on u and z guesses. So z is the output of the s-box, u is the input of the s-box. So z can be computed with the u guess. And then I will look for a collision between the two. After I find the collision, I had that kb was a linear function of u, z, and x, so I can recover kb based on the value of u, z, and x that I found. And then I recover the remaining part of the key from the rest of the values that I have. Okay. So this gives me whole key bits. So let's just check the complexity for a bit. So there are these many majority guesses that I have to do. There are two MITM stages. In each, in the first MITM stage, I have to eliminate some variables. I have to compute x and y based on k and kc for all these k and kc values. For the second MITM, I have to replace kb by u, z, x. So this is a so this is a matrix multiplication. This is a matrix multiplication. This was a Gaussian elimination. And then I have to compute u from z. This is evaluating the s-box once. And then for both cases, I have to evaluate a linear polynomial. So. That, that analysis of this one is a bit tedious, but you can, it's pretty similar to the previous one that I explained, but there are more details, so you can check out the paper for that. But we actually also implemented the attacks. Here you can see I have a variance for the full S-box version, full S-box layer version, and the partial S-box layer. So here you see I have the two-step MITM attack, here I have the linearization attack, and here is the gray code optimization applied to the two-step MITM variant. And as you can see, the gray code variant is way better than both the others, but already two-step MITM is faster than normal linearization. So 
the difference between the gray code variant and the non gray code variant of the uh, partial layer is subtle because exactly the the degrees of the equations will go higher, so the gray code method will be less effective, but still you can see that both of them are significantly better than the linearization attack. Okay, so now let's conclude this talk. Uh, this is a table of the complexities. You can find it in the paper, the more accurate version of it. So we've re represented attacks for both the full SBOX variant and the partial layer. So for the full SBOX variant, we have that we can break it up to three runs, as you can see here. For But uh, the north three round attack is still faster than ours. But for the two round version, our attack is the fastest up until now. Then for the partial SBOX layer, which is the actual interesting part of this work, I would say, we can break up to N over S rounds, which was not done before. And for all, for both 0 0.8 times N over S and N over S, we get faster attacks. So <clears throat> what, about, what are possible future works that can be done? One thing to check is that can this MITM slash gray code enumeration approach extend to more rounds? And the answer is yes. I would say almost yes. So this is some current work that we're doing. And the idea is we replace the majority function with some a more better tailored function such that the roots of it are ordered in a gray code manner. And uh, this will probably break uh, variance with more rounds. I think the last thing we have is we can break up to seven rounds, but the difference with a normal exhaustive search is really small. So there are still improvements that need to be done. And then another uh, interesting approach would be combining the linearization ideas with the parity counting methods from Dinor. Okay, thank you very much for watching this video and listening. And uh, if you were interested, if the talk was interesting to you, I would highly encourage you to read the paper. Here is a link to it. And thank you very much again.